Recording in progress. So good evening all. Um, my name is Stefan, um, Major Stefan Dabru-Hailing, and I'm a British Army pharmacist. I'm currently serving in uh, Preston at a unit called Free Medical Regiment. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about my sort of journey and background, a little bit about some of the roles um, that I've gone to within the military up until this sort of point, and then I'll kind of explain a little bit about um, other parts of the military and sort of the things that we can also get up to. So I um, studied at Bradford University, did the sandwich course. Um, beforehand, as I said before this presentation, that I'd actually done um, a combination of like combined cadets and army cadets at school, um, enjoyed both. Um, and I was quite interested actually in uh, joining the army full stop, despite obviously um, wanting to go to university at one point. So it wasn't so much a choice between pharmacy and the army, but I think both were on my mind at the time that I was going to uni. Um, in my second year of university, I actually joined the army reserves. It was an option to join them as a student um, and that was at my local detachment in Bradford um, and in doing so it helped me to actually get a really good in-depth insight into into what the sort of military life entailed knowing that I always had that um, that wish to kind of go full-time at some stage in my career um, on graduation I actually ended up um, staying as a reservist but um, doing community pharmacy and managing a super drug store in um, in Wakefield in West Yorkshire um, but obviously I'd done all my sort of basic soldier training whilst a reservist during my sort of first few years at uni um, following on from that I then ended up commissioning as a um, reservist officer into the army in 2013 um, but at the time, I'd already sort of made a decision to transfer across. So I'd put all the paperwork in to then transfer to the regular army. And I commissioned into the regular army in 2015 and had to go through the Sandhurst process again. Um, my first unit within the army was um, so all my experience up until that point, you see, would have been community pharmacy. And the army predominantly looks at us as quite generalist in terms of pharmacy, but actually when we deploy, and I'll get onto a little bit about later on, um, our main deployed role is within a field hospital, within like a military hospital, um, doing what a normal clinical pharmacist would do. Um, so the first um, job role that I had within the military was to be posted to the Royal Centre for Defence Medicine. And that's basically a part of the um, army unit that's based in the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham. Um, and I spent two years there and they wanted me to and obviously paid for my clinical diploma as well. Um, and, I, and I went through that sort of whole process with the uh, with the NHS team actually there being my kind of mentors and tutors. Um, following on from my time in RCDM, I then posted to a unit called 16 Medical Regiment. Um, and they're based down in Colchester and their main um, their main mission as a medical regiment is to support um, what is colloquially known as the paras um, but what is effectively the um, British Army's parachute brigade or airborne brigade um, so very high readiness so a lot of things are um, always planning always busy always ready to support um, activity that could happen anywhere in the world but not necessarily things happening at, at that sort of pace um, in reality but always being prepared um, and working as a pharmacist supporting that unit that then supported um, supported them and since then I've then posted to a uh, free medical regiment in uh, Preston and their role is to support um, other elements of the army um, that sit more in the what we call the light space. So um, different parts of the army differ from light roll to armored um, to airborne. And obviously you've got the other services in terms of the uh, Navy and the Air Force as well. However, um, as pharmacists, we only have the opportunity to um, join the army at present, um, either as a reserve capacity or as a regular um, pharmacist. Um, but they have recently introduced two 
small jobs into the RAF for reservist pharmacists to support um, what's known as the hospital support unit. Um, so kind of moving on to roles that, um, that we can do um, as pharmacists in the army and the kind of so what of those roles. So clearly the most important thing is we are we're all pharmacists we all know, we all know what that means we all know what that sort of entails um and the army um as a whole has um something called the army medical services which is a range of different professional groups um doctors dentists nurses um combat medical technicians who are quite unique um they're non-vocational healthcare providers. They respond to soldiers that are wounded um, at the point of care and do the, the bare minimum for them, really, in that sense, but are very often very life-saving and essential, and then make sure that the soldiers can then get um, sent back to um, a, a, an appropriate treatment facility. Um, and as pharmacists, our role in the um, kind of deployed space on all of that is to be part of um, what we call role two medical care. So role one medical care is what I've almost described there with the CMTs responding at the point of wounding. Um, but obviously, depending on the nature of injuries, a lot of people need to be taken to a hospital for damage control surgery um, and other sort of uh, either minor or major operations to make sure that they're um, that, that they're fine. Um, and clearly, as pharmacists, we will be working within the role two, which is basically a hospital space to um, provide that clinical pharmacy support um, to the hospital, make sure we're looking after the patients that are in the beds and doing the job that all you guys kind of know and, and, and probably would appreciate from some of the other um, work you're doing. Um, but we also massively get involved in something called medical logistics as well. Um, so as you know, there's a lot of sort of legal background behind um, the control and management of drugs, especially when it comes to um, controlled drugs and what in the army we call accountable drugs, um, which tend to be CDs that are uh, scheduled three and uh, four and above, should I say, but are also some other high value drugs. And we are often part of the, um, the team that will look at how we can procure those drugs from industry, how we can transport those drugs to where they're needed, making sure that they're appropriately temperature stored um, and in the right conditions, how we then would utilize them, store them where we are and make sure we're keeping hold of the CD registers and all and all that good and obvious sort of stuff. Um, and in a medical regimen, I would say my main role from that perspective is very much the latter side of it, the medical logistics side, but also it's the imparting of knowledge from myself to the CMTs and the doctors that I work with in the medical regiment that support the point of wounding care, um, making sure that they understand medicines management effectively and how best, because we don't necessarily deploy with them um, on so many tasks, so they need to be able to look after them drugs yourself, to um, look after the patients themselves and make sure they're given the right drug, right patient, right time, etc. So a lot of my sort of day to day work from this job perspective is very much um, training, overview, overseeing policy and that little bit of assurance to the sort of chain of command under which I work. Um, the Birmingham side of it obviously described what I would call a um, it's just joint hospital group. Um, they're known as now. We have a few of those dotted around the country, Frimley Park in the south, um, Birmingham and Plymouth, I think are the main ones that we as pharmacists can go to. And the medical regiments, again, there's a number of those that are dotted around the country. Um, we also have other opportunities for employment within the um, army space, such as um, we have a permanent pharmacist position working in Cyprus. And that pharmacist is very much responsible for um, again, the kind of medical logistics and, and medical provision piece, but for um, units that are working um, sort of in a broad theatres in the um, in the Middle East and and sort of further afield, where Cyprus is almost a, a, a midway provisioning point. Um, on top of that, the army also has its own sort of primary healthcare service. So obviously, normally if we get sick, we go to the GP. Um, but the army has what's called defense primary health care um, and it's the full 
range of care, as I'm sure you can imagine, everything from the doctors and nurses working in primary health care to the dentist to uh, mental health support, etc. Um, and actually, the way DPHC sort of align themselves is if a soldier goes to a med centre to see a doctor and then gets a prescription for something, yes, they may take it to the pharmacy that's located in that med centre, but the army doesn't employ as many pharmacists as you may imagine. So what the med centres effectively have is pharmacy technicians that will manage the dispensing and supply of um, drugs within that med centre. Occasionally they outsource it um, to local pharmacies that aren't outside the military train completely. Um, but the so what of that is that another role for us as pharmacists is to work almost as regional pharmacists, but within DPHC. So um, to, again, make sure that the farm techs are completely supported in terms of their education and development and the management of what they're doing in their area, to make sure that the med centre is working within the, um, within the confines of, of uh, GPHC regulations, etc. Um, and those roles as well, they sit, there's a few of those roles that sit within the army space, but there's actually a couple of those roles that sit within the MOD civilian space as well. Um, so people that aren't necessarily uniformed, but do still do those regional pharmacist jobs. Um, and as you progress, so they're sort of the jobs that you will do up until the point where I am as a, as a sort of major. Um, and as you progress a bit further on, you've then got um, the army obviously has is, is formulated around headquarters and sort of central points of areas where they will achieve what they need to achieve and decide how to plan and execute what needs to be delivered. And um, there are farms, there are pharmacist jobs at what's called army headquarters, um, effectively making sure that the army understands the whole piece of where we play into it all and, and, and what they need to know in terms of provision of drugs um, and medical material and also at what's called Surgeon General's headquarters as well. And Surgeon General sits outside of the army space, but in more of the joint military space. So I spoke earlier of the um, RAF and the um, Navy. Um, so the three of those will form what's called the Defence Medical Services. The Surgeon General effectively commands um, Defence Medical Services. So there's a pharmacist job there where they very much look at defence policy of um, medicines management um, and I mean obviously that role will involve absolute cross organizational collaboration so um, and I'm trying to think of specifically what I've written into my presentation now as well for the organizations that we will work with but I'm, I'm, you're obviously talking about liaising with the NHS liaising with um, with the like cross governmental and with the kind of MHRA and kind of key players in that sort of field to, um, and, and key challenges that were obviously apparent across the whole of um, not just where you would have seen a lot of our other colleagues working but for us as well was things like COVID and how that impacted both on um, both on the country as a whole but also on defence as a whole in the army and how the two could kind of link in. Um, so they're the main sort of background background roles of what we do, um, and it's it'd be remiss of me to say, obviously when we talk about the army, um, the the bottom line of the army is everyone in the army is trained to be a soldier, uh, trained to be a soldier first. So um, we've got um, a series of sort of skills and competencies that we all need to be capable of doing. I know obviously earlier on you you spoke of. Um, you spoke of shooting and the opportunity to do shooting in um, in uh, in cadets, and clearly the army is configured to defend the country and to defend the interests of, of, of the sort of nation. So um, at times they will deploy to areas where they may be under threat. Um, and as medical professionals, and I don't know if you've heard of the Geneva Conventions, any of you, by default we don't attack anyone, we don't fight, we don't. That's not what we're employed to do. Um, we're employed to provide medical care, we're employed to be pharmacists. However, we do need to know how to defend ourselves should um, should anything obviously happen. So we are all trained to, um, to use a weapon. We all need to be fit um, and capable of doing our jobs. We all do regular fitness training, regular PT and regular sports within the army as well. And we also got, get trained on a number of other key sort of skills that will save our lives. Things like... Um, um, 
basic basically how to look after a casualty that's just someone that's just fallen on the ground or someone that's just had like minor injury sort of thing so so a kind of enhanced first aid at work sort of thing but nothing on nothing too unusual from that um things like navigation how to obviously get from point a to point b if you're in the middle of a forest or woodland or a desert or something like that and you need to actually go somewhere to deliver care um things like um cbrn as well which is chemical biological radiological and nuclear um understanding and it's not so much to expect anything like that because fortunately things like that don't tend to happen on a kind of um global scale per that that much fortunately um but we always need to be wary of any kind of threats and be prepared to kind of protect ourselves and our patients and the people around us if we need to um and another sort of um key thing that we do as part of it as well is, is understanding the, the army very much works to its own um, values and standards as well um, and I think that's really key because clearly a lot of big organizations will do so I know a number of you will end up working for like um, a big multi-organization like your boots or whoever else or with like the NHS and they've all got their own values and standards but certainly it's something that um, the army absolutely signs up to um, in its own sense and ours are as simple as courage um, discipline respect for others integrity loyalty and selfless commitment um, so I think that explains some of the uh, some of the sort of background piece of all of this um, but a lot of my kind of presentation and, and again I'm sorry that it, I couldn't load it up on the screen to sort of show you um, was a little bit of kind of my actual personal lived experience of being in the army and kind of what I've um, been fortunate enough to uh, be part of to see and to do um, and I think one of the key reasons why I joined the army was um, working kind of nine to five in a, a community pharmacy um, it's there, there, there are many things that I think I enjoyed about that job um, looking after the patients having regular people that were coming to see you all the time um, getting involved in services I did a lot of things like flu clinics and whatever else um, flu vaccination clinics or and whatever else but it was the opportunity to kind of live and experience a completely different lifestyle where things like keeping fit and working with soldiers and playing sports was bread and butter of what I do um, and it's interesting that even today at work um, I'm in a very busy job with where I am at the moment in uh, in free med but we make time to um, play football on say a Wednesday afternoon for example and then we'll catch back up with the work that we need to do um, things that I've been fortunate enough to do I've been fortunate to go to Miami to play football with the um, army medical services um, for a couple of weeks I've been fortunate enough to go to Portugal um, to do athletics with the um, with them as well um, we also, as you mentioned before, get things like adventure training, etc. as well. Um, I actually did a little bit more adventure training in, while I was in reserves than I have done since I've joined regularly. But it's very much about prioritising what you want to commit to. Um, but the opportunities are very much endless. I've got colleagues that have done everything from golf to scuba diving to expeditions. And I don't know if you've recently seen, I work with a um, an Asian physiotherapist um, called Pre Chandy, who's recently become the first um, woman of colour to um, trek to the South Pole unaided. And she actually works in a medical regiment with me. So opportunities like that, she was very much supported by work to take time off to train, to um to work towards it she was funded by it to an extent in, in what she needed to do and then she's absolutely achieved something that i think surmounts many things that a lot of people are able to do um in, in, in a lot of different kind of roles um but obviously the main reason why the army kind of exists is for its operational output um i think when i was looking to join the army it was very much a time of kind of big campaigns like Iraq and Afghanistan um, and I'm sure you've all seen the news of all that sort of stuff growing up um, and I joined just after um, those have started to draw down but a lot of my colleagues worked as pharmacists in the hospitals in Afghanistan in Bastion for example um, providing medical there, care there to the soldiers that were that, that were fighting um, but also there's a lot of opportunities that the army gets involved in from the humanitarian perspective as well um when the ebola crisis happened in um, sierra leone 
Um, there was a pharmacist and a farm tech that deployed as part of the medical team out there to support the Ebola crisis and to obviously look after and do their piece with patients there. Um, and from my own personal perspective as well, um, I don't know if you all heard of the um, explosion that happened in um, Lebanon last year in Beirut. And I was working, I was actually doing a, commu a, a locum community pharmacy shift on a Friday and i got a call from work to basically say can you be on a plane on sunday to fly to beirut and i was only there for a few days but it was effectively to support the lebanese armed forces because they were very much trying to um trying to say i've just seen that question come through thank you i will answer that in a second they were very much trying to um just look after their people really obviously and get the country back to some sort of normality and there was a there was a big team of military planners a, sorry a small team of military planners that went out there to see what best the uk could support um the country with there were other nations that went there as well um but the reason why i was specifically there was to look at how best we could get drugs into the country to make sure that they got to the people that needed them and i was only there for three days but it was a it was an amazing experience um working out of the ambassador's residence as well which was quite a nice quite a nice location um the question i've just seen was how many pharmacists are in the army and that was very much part of my presentation as well so at the moment there are 12 regular pharmacists that are in the army we are very very small in terms of how many of us there are versus what role is kind of expected of us and the army is actually um it's um it, it wants to have 18 um potentially 19 pharmacists so you're not talking about many but we do have gaps and we are constantly looking for people that are interested in this thing as a regular pharmacist but also there are a number of reservist pharmacists um and clearly the day-to-day -day lifestyle of a regular army pharmacist versus a reservist pharmacist is, is different um, but as a reservist you tend to have a normal uh, job a lot of the reservist pharmacists will work in um, in hospitals um, or work in community for example but will do military weekends um, to keep their skills up and they still have the opportunity to deploy versus myself as a regular pharmacist where my every day is wearing uniform and doing jobs related to um, related to my role or related to trying to keep fit or keep active as a as an officer. Um, I think it's 17 reservists, but it's definitely 12 regulars that we currently have. Um, but we're certainly short on numbers at the moment. Um, and I think yeah, I've just seen. Thank you for sharing that link there about the, um, the how to apply. Um, I tried to get all that information across, but the, the, the information for how you actually join is, is fairly. Sh I think they've streamlined it a lot. So when I went through the process, it felt like a lot of um, a lot of kind of phone calls, and a lot of kind of where do I click and whatever else. But I think um, the army's done a lot over the last couple of years to sort of um, streamline the recruitment process. And there are things like um, look at life sessions. There are um, specific webinars you can kind of dial into that the army will run, the army recruitment will run, that will enable you to ask the right questions at the right time. The things like how much am I paid or how do I go through the process or what do I need for this or at what point do I start this training course or all those sort of really um, kind of in-depth questions are best done through that sort of forum. Um, but again, like I say, I'm trying to give you more the the kind of more lived experience of it all um, and, and how it is for me. Um, and just other things that I, we kind of get involved in the army. So it's not all about the for me, it's not all been about the pharmacy, um, which which again is something that's inspired me to join the army as well, because they very much employ me as a pharmacist and use me for that um, as my main role. and. We have things like readiness. So at the moment, I'm on five days readiness if the army needs to form a field hospital somewhere um, with one of the units. Um, but at the same time, um, in some of my roles with um, the medical regiment, for example, with 16, for example, I've had the opportunity to travel to places like Germany, to Croatia, um, to do um, just general army exercises where we're kind of living out in a field or in um, 
repurposed accommodation where we are kind of looking at the overall um, care and I'm working actually more from the headquarters point of view and looking more at things like medical planning and how we get the right uh, medical asset to the right place and supporting the whole piece there so there's a lot of kind of cross skills that you can get from that whole process as well um, I've also had the opportunity to go to Oman with the field hospital I was there for a good few months in 2019 um, and the reason for that is the British Army work a lot with the Omani, um, with the Omani um, Principality, and they um, use the uh, Omani Desert um, for sort of armoured exercises with tanks, etc. Um, but the problem with any training, and to be fair, any part of life is there's risk. And where there's risk, clearly people can get hurt. And where people can get hurt, they'll need medical attention. And one of the main kind of... Um, tenants of the army medical service and medical services in general from our, from our perspective is the ability, the ability to respond um, within the kind of correct timelines um, get into the patient as early as possible um, to stop a bleed for example and then getting them back to the other facilities so clearly when we go to remote areas in the world um, we often will deploy medical assets in order to make sure that there may, there may not be many patients that were there. We weren't very busy when I was in Oman in terms of patients coming through, and they were very minor, fortunately. But we also would never want to hear the worst case scenario, which is, um, let's say, a tank has a crash or turns over, or there's an RTA or something, and there's a number of soldiers and officers that are injured, and therefore we need to absolutely step up and perform our role. Um, and clearly, as I mentioned before, there is the there is always the ongoing threat of the worst, the, the the deeper side of the army, which is a war somewhere that we need to respond to, um, where there's the most likelihood of people getting hurt. Um, I've also been fortunate enough to do similar roles with the uh, navy. So as I said, there's no pharmacists on the navy, but the navy have a number of um, they have what's called a um, a role free afloat. So role free is effectively a hospital capability but a little bigger um, than a role two capability i think it brings in uh, assets such as ct scanners etc um and, and and i deployed with the navy to do what's called a medical validation to effectively to make sure that the kit equipment and people were best trained to deploy if they needed to so there wasn't any real need for for us to do anything we were more testing the asset and basically assuring the asset that we were that we were working on um again a little difficult because i'm not guided by the presentation and again apologies for not sharing it up with you but um before i move on to the question and answer session i'm just trying to think of any specific parts of that presentation i've kind of haven't covered through um but if not, then I'm happy to take, start taking some questions now. And I'm sure lots of the stuff that I'd written down and wanted to talk to you about, I can, I can get through to you. Um, I'm just going to have a look at Thank you so much. No I'm problem. Sure it's been quite full. We've had quite a few questions coming in already. So I think I'll start off with, um, let me see which one I should start off with. Yeah, so this one is one I wanted to pick up on. I know you mentioned the um, Sandhurst process. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing that's recruitment process so Isabella just asked hi I just qualified as a pharmacist and I was wondering when you applied to be an army pharmacist it can is it contracted for a minimum number of years and also can you give some tips to stand out in an interview so application to being an um, army pharmacist so two really good questions actually yeah two really good questions so um commitment wise I couldn't give you the, uh, the the definitive answer on this. Again, it's probably a question more for the recruiting team, but I think the minimum commitment is only three years um, or, or something along those lines. Um, clearly, a number of us will sign up for a lot longer beyond that, but I think what they initially do is they give you sort of a what's called a short service commission, and you've got a little bit of a return of service at the start and especially because they'll pay for things like your clinical diploma and stuff if you haven't done it or done it yet or anything like that um, but beyond that point you've then got the choice of well actually do I want to continue in service or not and, and it's a good question because when I first joined from community pharmacy I was very much thinking of one the right time to kind of make the jump but two kind of I guess we're always looking at our futures and what we want to do and I was very much thinking 
I'll graduate, I'll do a bit of community pharmacy, I'll understand that field, I, I want to join the army and go into the regulars and move into hospital pharmacy eventually, was my thinking at the time. Um, and I knew they'd pay for the diploma, so I thought I could do that, give a few years of service, and then leave and join a, um, a, a hospital, an NHS hospital. Um, but to be honest, I love it so much that I think I'm much more likely to stay in until I'm um, at, at retirement age. So um, I think that answers that side of it. And the other part of the question was, um, was what, sorry? The recruitment process, basically. So Yeah, so... You... Yeah, of course. So what you basically do with the recruitment process and, and in terms of standing out as well is they'll invite you for weekends like um, army officer selection briefing boards and stuff like that, where you'll be competing against other peers that probably are most likely not to be pharmacists, to be honest. They could be other um, AMS, Army Medical Services candidates, or they could be other um, people just applying to just be an officer in general. Um, and you'll do things like... Um, You'll have like discussions, you'll do planning exercises, um, you'll do um, fitness tests and the, the obvious things that you can do. And to be honest, all of you, you, you study in pharmacy, you're all intelligent people, you're all more than capable from that point of view that you shouldn't have too much of a problem when it comes to being tested intellectually. I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily worry about that. Being tested physically is another thing, but it's, it's, it's obvious you prepare for fitness, don't you? If you need to go, if you're being told you need to do a, uh, a bleep test to pass something, then you make sure you can do that bleep test. Um, obvious fitness tests that we do are things like um, 2k runs we used to do like the mile and a half run um, things like press press ups and um, sit ups but that's moved a lot more to kind of more functional kind of fitness so uh, things like sprinting between cones and um, carrying weight and pull ups and all that sort of stuff although knowing that pull ups aren't necessarily the easiest thing for a lot of people um, the army is in a process of developing pull-ups as opposed to forcing every last soldier to be able to do 100 pull-ups you don't need to be um super super fit you just need to be functionally fit um if you're the sort of person that does like a park run on a weekend for example then that would be um i, I would say something like that would be a good baseline to start with um and in terms of what you can kind of do i think it's very much recommended that you just stay well read with what's going on with public affairs be able to sort of talk to and debate with and 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 communicate with your peers um in a sort of in a sort of live setting and also just be wary that the army is looking for officers in particular to be leaders um but that doesn't mean that we have to know everything it just means that we have to have those sort of soft skills to be able to listen to develop and empower people um, and to be able to just what, whatever the sort of situation that you're approaching to use that kind of flexibility of mind and um, and, and and your sort of natural emotional and, and, and um, intelligence to kind of approach the situation and work it the best way around and that again it doesn't necessarily mean you have to get the right answer every time but it's the way in which you're getting the right answer we're not looking for bullies we're not looking for violence we don't it's 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 not about that it may be fallacies that may be seen on things like tv etc but that's not what makes people tick it's it, it's just trying to get the best from everyone really um so hopefully that answers all of that great so now we can move on to more questions sure so, loads send them yeah tamson asks do you have to be enlisted in the army to serve as a pharmacist in the army? So I'm guessing that means can you do it without being a reserve? That's a good question, actually. Um, so I think in the way, in the, the base way of answering that question, yes. Um, if you want to deploy with the army, if you want to do all the really obvious stuff that I said, yes, you do. Um, and, and as a pharmacist, you have to join as an officer. And that's how they employ us. And that's where that's where we sit. Um, but as I said, there are other roles kind of supporting MOD um, that I think, to be honest, the people that are in those roles are probably quite static and probably quite happy. But there are some pharmacists that work with um, Defence Primary Healthcare. Um, they're non-uniformed, though. They don't wear the uniform. They don't do the adventure training and all that sort of stuff per se, although they may be invited on it if they have the free time. But it's not part of their job. But to the, the parts that I've mentioned that I've got involved with, yeah, you need to be uniformed. 
Great. Um, Fumi asks, would you have to move around a lot or could you be stationed somewhere and only move when you choose to? It's a good question. Um, so there's a very common phrase that goes around the army a lot that the, um, the needs of the army come first and the needs of the individual come a close second. And the army is very much operated on a, a, it's a regular army, should I say, it's very much operated on the premise that you do jobs for two to three years in certain locations and then you move on to other jobs. Now, for someone like me, that's actually great because I enjoy the experience of seeing different sites and, and doing different things at different times. But clearly, a lot of people like to settle where their families, etc., are, and it can make things a little bit more difficult. Um, the army reserves is a lot more static and allows you to sort of join your local as long as there's spaces to join your local center and to parade at your local center and to sort of then live at home and obviously go on the weekends and the sort of um, annual camps and stuff and um, that you would want to great um next question it's kind of a common question so someone asked can i still apply to be an army pharmacist if i did my pre-reg in community and then another person asked would it be better to do a pre-reg in either community or hospital if you wanted to be a military pharmacist uh, um pre-reg almost the, the, the question the answer to the question is it really doesn't matter to be honest um because we look at the individual and we look at the skills i think there's a bit more of a um it's a bit more of a crossover of a hospital pharmacist and someone that's done pre-reg and hospital pharmacy um coming into it because they're probably a little bit more prepared um but i mean most of my background was in community pharmacy as soon as i got to birmingham i'd done six months actually um as part of my pre-reg in hospital but i'd forgotten a lot of that at that point to be honest and um, as soon as I got to Birmingham, it was very much a right, you're acting as a band six pharmacist here, um, you're a newbie, you'll have a mentor, you'll be shadowed, we'll, we'll, we'll look after you from an NHS point of view, the military will give you time to develop your clinical skills, um, and um, yeah, it's, it's not, it, it, it's not a, a, a one way or another sort of thing, I don't think. Um, but one thing I will mention as well, in terms of additional qualifications, um, the army is happy to support us to do additional qualifications and also pay for them. So as well as doing a clinical diploma, the army have also paid for me to do my independent prescribing. Um, I chose to do my independent prescribing in uh, malaria prophylaxis and, uh, and immunizations, actually. Um, and part of the reason was because obviously we travel to so many parts of the world and, and malaria is so prevalent in so many areas that I thought it would have a very clear um, kind of um need within within where i was at the time and what i was doing and that, and that worked really well um but on top of obviously doing the independent prescribing it also enabled me obviously with the pandemic that's going on at the minute and all the vaccination clinics that are running every year i actually deployed to london um at the start of last year to work as a the independent prescriber leading a team of six um traveling around a lot of the vaccination sites in um sort of east and south london um I think the other the rest in my team, there was two nurses and three um, combat medical technicians who I explained about before. Um, and I know a colleague of mine, I can't remember what her um, research was on, but she was um, she was sponsored to do an MSC. It had something to do with um, bone density, um, but I can't I can't remember the name of the drug. But the most important thing is she was sponsored to do some more um, another academic qualification, which the army very much do support kind of continuous professional development, both at the routine level and at the more in depth um, MSc level and other courses, etc. Anything else? A lot of questions. <laughs> it's fine. Um, someone asked um, would it be better to get experience uh, after your pre-reg year before you apply or well, military experience do you mean or, or no, no, just pharmacy experience or, or, yeah pharmacy experience <sighs> no I don't think I can answer that question per se because I think as a military pharmacist we're quite generalist anyway um, because our population group are typically soldiers and soldiers typically don't take many medicines or um 
and, and they're typically very fit and well. So in terms of some of the more in-depth stuff that you'd pick up from that kind of great experience, it, it, it doesn't necessarily cross over. Um, areas that we clearly do need to know about is sort of um, definitely a little bit about emergency medicine and ITU drugs and all that sort of stuff when we're looking after people that are really, really sick from trauma or something quite unusual like that. But um, I wouldn't say it's a necessity, but experience is always good regardless. Just bear with me two minutes. Okay, great. Um, to answer your question, Tamsin, about the age limit, if you see on the um, website that I link, it says age entry requirements, age 17 years, nine months to 36 years and 11 months old. So those are the um, age limits, I guess you could say, in when you can actually apply for this position. That's correct, um, but I think that's specifically for regular pharmacists. Um, yeah. If you wanted to join as a reserve, I think there's a slightly larger age window, um, but I'm not tracking that off the top of my head, unfortunately. Yeah, I think if you check the website, um, yeah. you'll get the exact information about that. Definitely, but... Uh, ready for another question? Yep, yep sure. Great. So um, Barjod says, thank you for your presentation. It was great to hear your views on it. I'll be um, soon doing a placement at Queen Elizabeth Hospital in the military ward. Mm -hmm. Would you say the role of the healthcare professionals in those wards are different to normal wards? No, the, the military ward per se doesn't uh, really exist. So the 412 in Birmingham, um, which is a TNO ward, um, used to be known as a military ward when we were in Afghanistan because there were a number of patients that unfortunately came through the ward. Um, but when I was there and worked on 412, um, it basically had a couple of beds at the end, which were kind of had a, a like it had a bit of a, a TV and PlayStation or whatever else in there for uh, military patients to use exclusively if they were there. Uh, and then like a couple of beds that tended to be more likely to be filled by military patients, if any. Um, but actually it's just the same as any of the other wards in the hospital. Um, and this, I think the second part of the question was any differences in the approach or anything like that. And no, not at all. Um, you find in, um, obviously in the hospitals where there's military personnel that work in uniform, um, you may find different leadership styles, etc. There's the RAF, the Navy and the army will have, um, nurses, for example, that may run some of the wards or whatever else, but. You, you may be surprised that even um, some of the hospitals like Nottingham, for example, you may be surprised that some of the consultants um, that work there are actually regular army uh, consultants. Um, but you would just never know unless you ask them the question because they need to stay clinically, uh, clinically current. <laughs> he's not past it. No, he's not. Yeah, definitely not past it. Um... <laughs> Great. Uh, any other questions? Sorry, I'm trying to figure out the orders to um, give them in. So another question was, how has COVID affected your role as a military pharmacist? <laughs> it's been a pain. <laughs> well, I think it's been a pain for everyone. And it's it's not really been the nicest time for anyone, regardless of professional roles or personal roles. Um, my unit that i was working at the time i was supporting a lot with the command of the one of the squadrons as well as um, leaning in with a lot of the pharmacy approach and there were differences between some was obviously people were working from home and um, there were some essential kind of activities that we had to carry on doing regardless to stay ready so there were a number of people that were st still in work um, i myself was working kind of throughout the initial kind of covid piece as well um obviously things that were that you're less likely to do but sort of make the military life a lot more enjoyable so we have like mess functions where we have like dinner nights and um all your sort of sport and, and pt and all that and at and all that sort of stuff all of that was obviously cancelled because of covid um so yeah it, it changed things massively really but i think it's unfair to, to kind of single it out because it I don't think it's not affected anyone. 
Great. And a follow up question was sent. Someone asked, what have you learned from how it's affected your role? Um, do you know, I think one of the initial kind of takeaways with COVID was there are certain random things that happen um, that you kind of think, why weren't we always doing this? Um, something as silly as, you know, if you go to like a joint canteen, for example, and in the past, people, even in schools, etc., people would just sit down at a table, just move on, they'd, someone would leave a tray there or whatever else. And then all of a sudden it changed and people were a lot more kind of infection control conscious. And they were like, right, before you leave, wipe down that table. Um, and obviously there was there was all the hand washing messages and whatever else. And I guess we've always, de depending on who you are, you've always probably been very kind of personal hygiene conscious. But I think it's that's been a massive kind of uplift in, in kind of how we are. I think the things like social distancing um, and isolations and stuff have it's it just made you see a different way of operating. Um, working from home is something the, the army had never really done much, I think, in a lot of jobs, but especially in the army as well, we, there's a lot of kind of meetings that go on at different levels, um, be that within a unit itself or between units. And a lot of the time people were traveling long distances around the country to, I've got to get to this meeting tomorrow at two o'clock, um, or it may be even earlier and I've got to travel four hours to get there versus now people utilizing skype and teams and zoom um etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think that's been massive but again it's not kind of army specific it's, it's happened to all of us at a similar kind of time great and um another question this seems really technical mm. <laughs> asked, when working with the powers did you have to pass p koi <laughs> I didn't have to, no. I wish I did. Um, I was encouraged to, but I haven't done it. But um, ironically, the pharmacist before me and the pharmacist after did. <laughs> probably not. Probably not a good thing to admit. <laughs> but we do have the opportunity to do it. Great. Hope that was helpful, Libby. Gabriella <laughs> uh, um, said, "Hello. Do you need a, to have a British citizenship in order to join? I'm from Romania." Um, I don't, I, I, I'm going to say no, from what I understand, but I don't know as well, because I know the army does recruit massively from like, um, um, from Commonwealth countries, etc. Um, so I think you're better off just asking the recruitment team. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure. The army is quite, is, is more diverse than you think though, but not quite as diverse as society in areas like the big cities like your London's, your Nottingham's, your Bradford's, etc. Great. Yeah, if I'm sure if you look on the website, you'll have like an email that you can send these questions to, or you can attend one of the recruitment or insight events, and I'm sure someone will have yeah. the exact answer for that. Um, someone asked, in terms of far, far, further pharmacy training, what does the army offer? So I know you mentioned before independent prescribing and they mm -hmm. wanted someone to do a master's. Is there anything else that they offer? Um, often no, because I don't think, um, and, and I don't mean that in a negative sense, but it's more because, like I say, there's only a handful of pharmacists full stop in the army. So who's going to suggest it to you almost? It's, the army's focused on its bigger outputs really than our development and what we should be told to do. But the opposite also exists where if you as an individual clinician want to specialize in a certain area, um, then you're more than welcome to. I think um, we would absolutely encourage and are encouraged to kind of keep going with our development and we're absolutely supported to do um, kind of training courses and where the funding is available and where it's it, it, it meets a clear operational need or, or a good enough need for the individual then the army will likely support you to do those that training great next question um compared to your community pharmacy experience how are the hours different being in the military <laughs> that's a good question uh working in community pharmacy the hours are what they are it was half eight till half five every single day end of story um working in the army um 
the hours can be anything from being on an exercise for a few weeks at a time where yes you'll get some downtime and be able to do whatever else but it's technically 24 7 i guess because you're not at home um versus you can um we tend to have late starts on mondays in most regimental life we'll have early finishes on a friday we'll have sports afternoon on a wednesday if you need to cut away to do essential stuff with your family or whatever else you're not really going to be stopped or asked major questions per se but at the same time you still need to deliver your job so it's gone from being very fixed to quite fluid i would say and quite different depending on what the week is and what the task at hand is Um, someone asked, how do you think the role of a military pharmacy is going to develop? I also wanted to ask as well, because um, eventually we will graduate as independent prescribers. We've kind of changed, made changes to the M-Farm course. So I was wondering if you had so, opinions on how that would affect it. It's a really good question, actually. So I spoke about earlier about, um, about role one um, care. And at the moment, the army very much from a there are a lot of kind of small scale deployments to many parts of the world where we will um, be training and mentoring or just helping with certain things that are happening um, in outreach places. And there's always going to be, if, if there needs to be, there'll always be medical cover there. And it's normally done by a combination of a general duties medical officer. So a just finished the first couple of years of being a doctor and are doing their initial kind of army contract before they specialize and the combat medical technicians and maybe a nurse um, and they tend to um, do a lot of that care and, and I as an independent prescriber knowing that I've got we've got colleagues that work in things like A&E for example um, and that we can very much help from that point of view of role one care if we're correctly trained to do so think that those opportunities could open up to us in the future but I'm not, but because of the numbers um, that we have, and because of the, um, the, the the critical nature of us as a as a sort of profession, um, I don't know if there's a real appetite for it to change that way. But I do feel that that's a possibility. Um, beyond that, I think obviously hospital care will never change. It will always be needed. Where it's needed is a different question. Great. And um, could you talk more about the um, international opportunities you get as part of the military and as a military pharmacist? Um, I think it depends on where you are and um, what your unit at the time is doing and also what your current role is. So while I was at 16 Medical Regiment, even though it wasn't directly related to the pharmacy side of things i had the opportunity to travel around when the squadrons were going on their overseas exercises i was able to be part of the headquarters teams or the the squadron headquarters teams to kind of look at um how best to um for the for the capability to kind of work when it was there um and i think there's opportunities from that point of view in the Middle East, in parts of Africa, in um, parts of Europe. Um, I've known colleagues that have gone to America on certain exercises and all sorts. So it it's really hard to put your finger on it, depending on what's going on. But um, and, and and I think as well, it's very much a, in, in your career is like this anyway, whether you're in a military or not. But I think very much in the military, there's a lot of personal ownership over it. Um, to an extent in the sense if you don't want to get involved in some of the opportunities that sit outside of your normal pathway then you don't do them um, but I chose the opposite very much and readily put my name forward to say actually I want to do that um, I know it's not normally the beaten path for someone like me but can I do it can I get involved and was was accepted to do so great um, so Libby asks, how did you manage to balance pre-regia with being a reservist? Uh, I probably didn't actually. I think I just concentrated more on my pre-reg. Um, so my reservist attendance, at, when I first joined in second year, it was quite high for the first couple of years. And then 
between my final year and my pre-reg year, my first year qualified, it dropped off a little bit and then it picked back up um, afterwards. It's not to say that I couldn't have, but I, I think that I think that's the honest answer for how I patterned it all. I concentrated on the priority, was which was to get my uh, to get my qualification. Great. Um, someone asks, can I get started with the army now? Are there any training schemes or do I have to wait until I qualify as a pharmacist and have my degree? And also, could, um, could you maybe, if you know how um, about it, explain how people can apply now and get um, some of their degree funded, I think? Yeah, so um, not something that I'm, again, an expert on per se, but I do know that the, um, I think we've got a few people that are currently on bursary. Um, because we're obviously trying to get the recruit the the numbers up to maximum um so there is a potential for things like bursaries um but it's not something that you'd, you'd have to kind of go through to the recruiters to kind of ask the in-depth questions um it's not something that i've come preloaded with the real answer for I will drop the link to um, discuss these things with the recruiters in the chat in just yeah, a moment. Cool. Um, if so you need any help finding any of these links, just let me know, okay? Thank you. Uh, here's a realistic <clears throat> question. Do the military pay, pay well? <laughs> um, yeah, so I'd say from what from what you'd get as a band six, um, they pay higher than that. They average out just above i'd say just above 8b is what most of us are on after about six or so years service um i think it, it kind of they try and make sure that the medical services match um match what we pay the civilian counterparts are paid um but i think it's just about ahead i think when i first transitioned across after a few years experience in um, community pharmacy, I had a slight drop followed by a rise and it's, it's tracked a little bit higher since. But also all of the uh, rates of pay for the army are available open source if you just Google army officer pay. Great. Um... Are there any specialist roles for pharmacists in the army or are all the viable, no, all the available roles the same as each other? They're all specialist roles more than the other way around, I think. I think they're all quite unique in their outputs. Um, the DPHC kind of regional pharmacist roles are probably the most similar. The medical regiment roles all differ because the output of each regiment kind of differs a little bit um and the the cypress role is definitely very specialist there's another um medical regiment as well which is um not a medical regiment sorry another regiment you can post to as well um which is actually a logistics regiment um, where you're very much more involved in the medical logistics side of it more than anything else um so they all, I think they're all quite different journeys from each other. Someone, uh, or two people asked actually, how is the rank progression in the military? So good, good question. So I, I think um, your pre-reg counts as a year of seniority because I joined uh, a good few years after university. I actually started as a captain um, and that was 2015 and I picked up my major in 2020 um, or off the board in 2020 wearing in last year. Um, so that took sort of five years. I think the sort of typical rank for pharmacists stays around the major level because um, we cap at sort of lieutenant colonel in terms of specific pharmacist output um there are opportunities depending on what you do and where you go to transfer into other kind of career streams once you're serving but um clearly if you're employed strictly as a pharmacist it's, it's really those kind of free ranks that you'll probably spend most of your time at 
and most likely tap out at major. Great. Um, Hannah asks, during uni, what things do you advise us to join or take part in to make us stronger applicants in for military pharmacy? OTC, probably, if you're really interested in it, is probably the main one. Um, the Officer Training Corps at universities, I never did it because I wanted to do the reserve side of things and see it that way. And also because I was in Bradford, I didn't really fancy travelling to Leeds every week. Um, but, yeah probably OTC would be the most obvious one but I think being involved in anything extracurricular is always good for your development anyway. Yeah I think I've, I think that's right. Yeah it is yeah. Great. Um, so um, what is this? Is there anything you wish you had done differently or wished you had known before joining? Um, do you know, the biggest thing I reflect on is um, possibly whether I waited a little bit too long to transition from community to regular. Um, done differently, not really. No, I think I've really enjoyed it. Um, Great. And um, Libby asks, uh, this is quite a personal scenario. So mm -hmm. Libby says, I've passed main board and have one year of uni left. Then okay. my pre-reg. Would you recommend doing those two years commissioned or as a private? I've got a place at Sandhurst 2024 for the regular PQO course. So okay. I was wondering if it's possible to keep military skills ticking over as a soldier or officer with the balance of pre-reg and final year of uni. Um, I think if you're already quite well way through the journey, don't force it. Um, you don't, obviously, even though we all need to understand the soldier skills and whatever else, um, we're not employed to kind of be leading and fighting from the front as soldiers. Um, having the basics and the understanding of the skills is probably quite useful, but to be an expert in them isn't quite as necessary. Um, and clearly, I think I'd probably be quite do, do you quite a service to say make sure that you tick off your main priority which is getting qualified first um and then if you then feel like you still got capacity to do any of that it would be an option but i wouldn't i wouldn't force the issue great and, and also good I luck have... <laughs> great <laughs> yes actually good luck and um I have a few questions because uh, mm -hmm. it's also great to learn about your personal experience and the working life and all that. So I wanted to sure. ask, what um, is the working environment and culture like in the army? I know a lot of our attendees probably haven't experienced it before. Good, good question, actually. Um, I can tell you what it's transitioning from, um, but I think what it's like depends on where you are. I think the army as a whole, and this is this is very much a, a big personal touch as well as anything else, has very much gone from uh, um, you, you go on PT and people will be shouting and screaming at you like, get there, get to the top of the hill, do this, do that, do whatever, right, go and run to that tree line and give me 10, 20 or whatever else. It's, it's very much transitioned that more to a very much an empowerment and transformational kind of space where the army senior leaderships very much realized that things like diversity and inclusion are essential to us being the most kind of effective army i don't think we're quite there yet um from personal experience but i very much support a lot of the uh the activity to try and get us there as quickly as possible um one of my kind of secondary duty roles actually the army had what was called the army bame network and it's now called the army multicultural network um, for example, it's also got all sorts of other kind of employees and support networks to, um, to make sure that we do close all those sort of gaps. Um, and I very much support them a lot um, in a lot of my outputs as well. And, th and those are sort of things that I know I've not come on to talk specifically about that to, to you guys as pharmacists, but those are things that I think you can get involved in regardless of what job you have, um, because they're important, and especially if they're important to you. Um, and, and I think it's doing a lot to close the culture gap. but i'll ask the same question about society really what's what society doing to close the culture gap there's 
there's discrepancies everywhere, unfortunately. And I appreciate you mentioning that as well, because it is important to consider and also for our attendees to take forward wherever they go. Mm. Um, other questions. Uh, what are your least favorite and favorite parts of your role and being in the army? Good question. Um, I'd say the most favorite is um, and I think it's partly what I've kind of positioned myself as much to do is to be able to be a leader and to be able to support the development of other people and have sort of soldiers and, and officers working in and around me and have that quite close knit um, peer group um, and close peers and sort of near peers that you're, it, it, the army kind of feels like a, a lifestyle more than just a job. Um, working nine to five just felt like a job. Like you turn up and then that was it and you go home and everything else is completely different. Um, and I think that's probably the, the thing I enjoy the most. Um, the thing I probably enjoy least is ironically something that I actually do enjoy and also it's quite frustrating. And I think it's uh, um, the army needs to be able to apply at short notice. It needs to be adaptive. Um, and I both really, really love the challenge of traveling everywhere and doing things and moving around as much as kind of sometimes you just want to be sat at home and just kind of not be on that full journey so it's, it's I think it's that's more of a weird conundrum of it all um, and you're very much in the army is very traditional by its structure uh, and very much you've got a rank structure you've got a clear hierarchy um, if you're asked to do something you, you you really should be doing that something if you're asked by the, the right sort of person um and i think most of the time that means you, you just get on with it but sometimes you just kind of bite your tongue but i again i i don't see the how that's any completely different to a lot of other jobs i think it's just really obvious experiences that you have working within something that's quite particular Great. Uh, a few more questions to go, yep. and then I'll let you go for the evening. Thank you Thank so you. much. Uh, <laughs> what skills do you think a military pharmacist needs to have that are like different from the regular skills you need to have as a civilian pharmacist? Just checking. Do they mean professionally? Yes. Well, profession. Yeah, I guess professionally, but also the like. Uh, I don't know the additional skills that we have as pharmacists, like empathy and communication sure so i think the foundational skills of a pharmacist are essential i actually find um in a lot of what i do the fact that i've qualified as a pharmacist actually makes a lot of the other things a lot easier the sort of emotional intelligence the ability to communicate the ability to work as part of a team a lot of the things that um and I probably should know this off the top of my head. I don't know how many of you guys do. You know when the, the GPHC has got its sort of founding, its pillars. When you look at a lot of those, you can actually just pick them up and put them into skills that are really useful for military life. I think some of the things that sit on top of that is probably a little bit more of the leadership piece and a little bit more of the ability to be flexible, dynamic and adaptable, um, more so than just being a, a, a civilian pharmacist. But... Uh, yeah, I, I definitely think a lot of the skills are quite um, crossover really, really well. Great. And um, an attendee asks, is the environment LGBTQ friendly? Uh, yeah. In yeah. Um, but there are people that make that either make mistakes or probably more than cross the line. But um, I mean, I, I'm happy to even say an example in my in my local unit, um, we're setting up something called an inclusion council where we're wanting to have um, leads from each um, protected characteristic um, run forums and make sure that we're specifically identifying the needs of all of those. And I had a good chat with a soldier that had posted in from another unit in December um, who was the, the person that's actually going to probably run the LGBT plus side of that. And there's a network, there's an army network that sits, there's, it, it has to be, it is, 
it wants to be because of the nature of a lot of people wanting to do the right thing and, and, and do what is absolutely normal in life but at the same time there are um there are failures but um and i yeah you hate to see them glad to hear there's progress being made though definitely um are there any resources you would recommend to our attendees who are all um students or newly qualified pre-regis i hadn't thought about that question actually um No, I think I think if you if you go onto the um, the sort of army jobs websites and the websites that you've shared already and kind of look at that insight stuff, I think pick up the resources and stuff through what they're recommending would probably be the best passage. Uh, would probably be the best answer to that question. I think um, there was one website I did go on um, in drawing up this presentation for you guys, um, and it had a couple of books that Sandhurst recommended in general um, that you could access. Um, of, of, being a leader and all this sort of stuff and um, just general tips for how to get ready for that. I think that's probably your best way of going, um, but I don't have anything out of the ordinary for you. Okay, great. Um, so that's all the uh, questions that we have. Thank you so much. I wanted no to uh, ask if there's anywhere our attendees can reach you, if they have any extra questions or questions that weren't comfortable having been asked, like, uh, answered in public. Are they comfortable going through yourself? Because obviously you've got my email address. Yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. I've got I've got no drama in answering any questions. And if people are genuinely, genuinely serious, um, I've always been happy to have those sort of initial conversations. And we've got um, every time that anyone sort of joined, we've set up a, um, a specific regular pharmacist WhatsApp group, for example. So we because we are such a small um, group of um, individuals we do uh, i mean communication's better for all of us really isn't it so mm. don't, don't be too shy hopefully great bunch of thank yous coming in now i've just shared yeah, my problem. email thank you address so, much, all of you. so if you have any extra questions for stefan um send them through to me and i will forward um them to him and uh that would be a great way of getting in contact um also would you i know it's such a shame your presentation wasn't loading today but would yeah. you be able to me and I can send it to our attendees should be able to yeah great I will send that round to you guys give me a few weeks it's exam season and I'll also send some of the links that I sent in chat today so mm -hmm. the site for the um, pharmacist officer role the upcoming army insight events and all of that but other than that I just want to say a massive thank you to you Stefan for spending your evening with us it's been so informative and um, mm -hmm. we're just so happy and thankful that you just gave up your time to give us more information I'm no, sure. no problem. Honestly, it's an absolute pleasure. And thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, all of you take care. Also, I, I know you're at various journeys um, or levels of journey within you. Sorry, my dog just gone because the doorbell's gone. Yeah. Um, various parts of your journey within uh, your uni studies, etc. So all the best with all your studies and, and your future careers. Thank you so much. All right, take care. And take care. Have a good right. evening. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.